astrophotography journeys we encounter situations where we want the detail that we get from a long focal length telescope but we want the field of view that we get from a short focal length telescope and this really comes about with the larger objects in the sky here in the northern hemisphere things like the Andromeda galaxy the North American nebula and the elephant's trunk nebula and others in those situations the best solution in the end is probably a mosaic Mosaics can be quite intimidating uh, for beginners, but once you've mastered plate solving, it really it becomes a possibility and is much easier to realise. In this video, I'm going to show you how to plan a mosaic in Sequence Generator Pro, and then once I acquire the data for it, I'm then going to show you a really quick and easy way of actually combining the images into the mosaic using a piece of software that's actually available free on the internet. So let's get started. So we'll start with the planning of a mosaic. Uh, I control all my astrophotography from Sequence Generator Pro, so that's what I'm going to demonstrate this in. But there are facilities in other programs. So in SG Pro, I click Tools, Framing and Mosaic Wizard, and this dialog appears. Now it's important that you've got the right profile loaded for your equipment. Uh, if you haven't, then you'll have the wrong scale values and pixel values in here. And it's really important that those be correct, otherwise this, this wizard doesn't work right. So in my case I've got 0.98 arc seconds uh, per pixel and 6248 by 4176 uh, pixels in the image. So I can now type in the name of the object. So I'm going to click here under object and I'm going to choose the elephant's trunk nebula which is designation IC1396. You can try the name rather than the designation. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Depends on the object. Now the field of view that you fetch from the database is important, needs to be wide enough. If it's not wide enough, for example, if I were to choose two degrees and click fetch, it will fetch two degrees worth of image and you can see that's not the whole of the object. I happen to know that if I fetch six degrees then that's about right. So you can see now the whole of the object. Sometimes you get these weird lines coming in from the database. That's just probably aeroplanes flying through when they acquired those images uh, automatically. And so you don't need to worry about that. Now I can rotate this selection using the rotate selection slider until it's in the orientation that I want for my framing. Let's say about there, for example. If I now click and drag a single rectangle, you'll see how much I can frame with a single shot. And clearly if I want the whole of the elephant's trunk nebula in my image, then that's not going to be enough. So I need to use a mosaic. Now, down the bottom here we've got this camera tiles one by one. And we can change those numbers to two by two, uh, three by one, whatever we want. So I'm going to choose, th if I choose three horizontally, that's... Enough. It's a bit tight with two, so I'll just check that with two. Yeah, it's a little bit tight for me. I like to have a bit of a, a border around the object. And then vertically, I'm going to need three as well. So I think that this works really nicely. But bear in mind here, having to do nine tiles or panels instead of one is nine times the imaging time, nine times the data. So just be aware of the, the amount of hours of imaging that you're going to need to do um, before you get too 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 crazy on how many tiles you have in your mosaic. So I'm happy with that and I can now click on create sequence and I can give it a name. Now just a tip here it's it's a good idea to use a short name. If I were to write elephant's trunk nebula in here then when I get into the sequence panel uh, the place where the name is displayed is, is rather narrow and you won't be able to see the dash one, dash two, dash three on the right hand end, which is important to be able to see. So I'm going to keep it short. I see 3096 is fine. And I want them to be the only ones in my sequence. So I'll replace whatever's in there with these ones. And I use plate solving. I think really to, to do this, it's really important that you've already mastered plate solving so that you can really frame up these shots really, really accurately. And that you're using a rotator or at least a manual rotator uh, to get the orientation as well as the position correct for mosaicing. 
So slew to and center on location, rotate or validate camera angle are selected and I'll tick, uh, leave this ticked associate working image with sequence so that this picture here is available to refer to at any time when I'm doing my imaging. So I now click OK and it says it's happy, it's successfully created nine new targets and when I click OK the sequence panel comes up and here you can see my IC, IC1396 dash one down to dash nine all ready for populating so for example I might want to do narrowband so I'll do three lights in hydrogen alpha oxygen and sulfur and we'll do 180 seconds of exposure time in each one and I'm going to have 17 seems a strange number but uh, there's a reason for that um, I'm going to use 17 three minute shots on each filter I'm just trying to squeeze a whole session into one night and that's how long the night is basically that's why I ended up with 17 um, okay so I can get, need to go to every single one of my frames and set them up that way uh, so I won't bore you with watching me do all of that but uh, let's skip forward and I'll actually go and acquire this data and I'll be back in a second with the data and show you how I process it and form an image Okay, so I've acquired the data, and you can see here uh, in one of my folders, so this is for IC1396-1, here are my 17 uh, images, and similarly I've got 17 images in each of the other eight uh, panels as well. So I'll then go and uh, stack those using Deep Sky Stacker with the associated flats that I also took on the night, and my darks, my 180 second darks from my dark library and that will produce a final stacked image and then I can open the stacked image in Photoshop. So here is uh, the Photoshop image, this is actually panel number five and this is as it comes out of Deep Sky Stacker. So what I'm going to do is image mode 16 bits per channel, change it to equalize histogram, click OK and then just do a little bit of curve stretching. Now it's really important because we're doing a mosaic that we apply the same stretching adjustments, uh, curves and level adjustments to every single panel. So m instead of just doing it by eye, actually make a note of what you're doing and then apply the same corrections to all the other panels. So I'm starting on the central panel, which is number five, and I'm gonna do a little bit of a curve stretch here. and note these numbers 161 and 105 161 and 105 click OK and obviously I'm doing this very quick and quick and dirty just for the purposes of illustration so or demonstration so now I can do a levels adjustment and maybe I bring the black level up to 16 this number here 16 so I've made a note of those numbers I can now save this image and then go and repeat those changes so on the other images so for example I can go to number one go to my stacked image and open it up and do the same thing again image mode 16 bits per channel equalize histogram and then image adjustment curves. Only this time, after I click the line, I'm actually going to type in my 161 and my 105. Now strictly, because I've used equalized histogram, I'm not quite doing the same thing to every image here. So it's a little bit crude. If you use exposure and gamma, then do all of your adjustments using levels and curves. Uh, and record all the numbers and repeat them, then you really are doing the same thing to each image. So uh, this is just for, for a quick demonstration. So I'll do my image adjustment levels as well. I'll bring up my black level, and I think that was 16 that we used. So I've now done the same adjustment. So I can now save that image. So once I save all those adjusted images, and then uh, at the stage where I want to mosaic them into uh, one big image for the hydrogen alpha. So that's the next step. 
Now the program I'm going to use to form the mosaic is called Image Composite Editor and it was created by the Microsoft Research Computational Photography Group and they have this web page here which explains that the project has been retired and that the, uh, the program is no longer available. But actually if you go to Google and type in Image Composite Editor Download you will actually find places where you can down, still download the program. So have a look around and see where is a good place to get it. I use the 64-bit version for Windows. So next thing I'm going to do is to run that up. So when you run up Image Composite Editor, you get this dialog here, and we're going to click on New Panorama from Images at the top. That brings up the dialog box and I've put my edited images all into a folder called Mosaic under HA and I've actually binned them two by two as well so that they load quicker and Mosaic quicker. In any case my pixel size is a lot smaller than my resolution so binning two by two here is fine and I probably could have binned two by two when I acquired the images actually. So I'm, here are my nine images and I'm going to click open and they come in. Now it's really important that the file names are all the same and that you have a one, two, three numbering system within your images. This is important because this program uh, works out which image goes where in a particular way and I'm actually using the file names to do that. So I'm starting each file name as part one, part two, part three, up to part nine. and You'll see why that's important. You can actually sort by capture time as well but I'm going to sort by file name instead. Okay, so the next thing is to click on Structured Panorama and you'll see that it, uh, it's got the arrangement of these images completely wrong at the moment. So the first thing to do is to make sure that we it knows that the image number one is in the top right hand corner. And if you recall on the Sequence Generator Pro plan, image number one was at the top right hand corner and the number two was to the left, number three was to the left of that and then number four was the right hand image in the second row etc. So it's a kind of zigzag pattern starting in the top right hand corner. So what we need to do is to tell it where to start and that's the top right hand corner of this grid so I'll left click there It now has put image one in the right place but you see the rest of them are still incorrect. So the next thing it needs to know is that the next image is to the left and not down. At the moment it thinks it's down. So we're going to click here to show that we start moving in a leftward direction. And you can now see that these three images are the right ones, but there's still something going wrong below that. And that's because it defaults to a serpentine arrangement, whereas we have a zigzag arrangement. So we go one, two, three, but our image four needs to be here, not over here. So I'm going to switch to zigzag and now you can see that all of the images are in the right place and uh, and we're, we're in good shape. So that's all we need to do on this screen and now we just go up to the top and click here on stitch. So now it does some work and it's incredibly quick how it does this and what's amazing about it is how seamless how seamlessly it does the job. So long as you did a reasonable job of applying the same stretch uh, and, uh, and levels adjustments to all of your images, you won't see, hopefully, any joins or nasty, nasty uh, sort of uh, step changes at the boundaries between the images because this program does such a good job. So you can zoom the image by rolling the wheel and you can also rotate it with the left mouse as well just to get it oriented how you want. And uh, and then once you're happy, fact, I'm just I'm going to leave it like this so I don't have to crop any more off than necessary. And now I'm going to click on crop. That takes us into the cropping window. Now here I can click and drag in the corners or the edges to do my cropping by hand, or I can use the auto crop facility by clicking on auto crop. It works out the minimum amount of crop to give you a complete image. I would not recommend trying the autocomplete. Autocomplete tries to make up uh, Im imagery to put in these empty areas in order that you keep all of your 
mosaic image and you add things in to fill the gaps around the edge. It doesn't work well with astrophotography photos. Just use the auto crop uh, would be my recommendation. So I'm happy with that as my crop and I can now click on export. So it applies the crop and now here is my uh, complete image ready to be exported. It's showing that it's a 49 megapixel image. If I hadn't binned 2x2 two two, it would be almost 200 megapixels at this point which is fairly eye-watering so maybe you can see now why I binned 2x2. Two two. I can choose a file format if I want a JPEG I can choose the quality of it how much compression it applies. Uh, obviously I don't want to lose quality if I, but I wouldn't really tend to use JPEG much there anyway. I can output as a TIFF, as a PNG, as a bitmap etc. So it depends what you want to do, it suits your purpose. Uh, you can choose the format you want and then click export to disk and give it a file name my mosaic and click save and it'll save your mosaic image. Now I will repeat that process for each of HA, Oxygen and Sulphur and then I will go back into Photoshop and do the final merge and colour adjustments to create my final image. If you're using a colour camera obviously then at this stage you're pretty much done apart from your final adjustments to your mosaic image. I hope you found that useful and uh, wish you clear skies and I'll see you next time.